What's up, my wizards? It's Dev from SBMTG down there. We like magic, and today's deck is a really good one because it's got pretty much all three things that I look for the most in any magic deck. It's affordable. It's under $100. That's good news from the start. It's also fun. It's an all-in-combo deck. You know, I tend to like those. And best of all, maybe, it's competitive. I happen to know that multiple teams tested this deck for Pro Tour Dominaria, so if they're taking it seriously, maybe you should too. Today, we're talking about Mono Blue Paradox. Now, truth be told, this deck has been around for quite some time at this point, but it's popping back up on people's radars recently because it turns out that now is the time to play your janky combo deck that goes off on turn five or six. And it's not just me saying that, I'm just some guy on a couch. The results do bear that out. You know, not only did this deck recently have a good showing at a Magic Online Championship Series, but New Perspectives Combo, that janky old thing, is popping up a lot in results lately too. So now is the time to play a deck like this for a variety of reasons. And honestly, when you boil it down, it's pretty simple why these decks are having at least a little bit more success lately, and it's not because they're any better. They haven't really picked up any pieces from recent sets. It's more in how the metagame has evolved around them, you know? Mono Red, Red Black, Blue White Control, and even the Constrictor decks that are sort of batting cleanup, we all have a fighting chance against. Now they all present unique problems to this deck. If Mono Red or Black, Black Red curves out and fills its board and gets a really fast start, that can present some problems. But if they don't kill us by turn five or six, we can easily end the game against them. Blue White Control can sandbag us by countering Aetherflux Reservoir and other important plays, but we have counter spells against their counter spells to force through important plays, and we just bury them in a mountain of card advantage. So we have a fighting chance against them too, and as far as the Constrictor decks, we are way faster than them, and they present the least of our problems. So a big reason why these decks are doing a little bit better recently is because all of the quote best decks in the format we can beat. But now I finally get to show you how. What are we, like eight minutes into the video? I hope it's only like two minutes, but I'm wasting time. Let's actually show you what this deck does. I wouldn't be surprised if you hadn't seen it before, even though it's been around for a couple of years. Sort of had its moment in the sun, was known as Blue White Cheerios back in the day, but it's gone dormant. It's gone underground for like the last year here. So in case you haven't seen what we're trying to do, it all starts with Ether Flux Reservoir, which we're going to play three copies of. Now once we get Aetherflux down, we're really only concerned with playing as many spells as possible, usually on the following turn. So we want to play this on turn 4, and then on turn 5, just effectively become a Storm deck and play as many spells as we can, hit that 50 life threshold, and end the game right then and there. Now there's some obvious math that you'll have to do when storming out to determine exactly how many spells you have to cast with an Aetherflux in play to get the requisite number of life and in the game. But, just because I'm a nice guy, I'm going to give you a handy dandy chart here. On the left you see the number of spells that we've cast in a given turn, and on the right you'll see how much life we've gained in that turn. So, if we've cast 5 spells, we've gained 15 life in that turn. If we've cast 7 spells, we've gained 28 life. Most importantly, once we cast 8 spells, we've hit 36 life and if your opponent hasn't pressured your life total too much at that point you're gonna win the game right then and there sometimes it's gonna take nine spells and of course if you hit 10 spells you win the game on the spot no matter what your life total was when you started now those are the base numbers, but there are some things that can throw this math off a little bit. Obviously, if you have two Aetherflux Reservoirs in play, that'll complicate things a little bit, but that's the good kind of problem to have, so count your blessings. But there's also a nifty trick we can do where, let's just say we haven't cast any spells this turn so far, for the sake of argument. We can cast a spell and then respond to that spell with an instant while the first spell is still on the stack. Well, when they resolve, Aetherflux Reservoir's triggers will count that you've cast two spells this turn, for both triggers. So that's an important trick to remember. You have a little bit of access to it. There are only five instant speed spells in this entire deck, but it is an important thing to remember if you're trying to storm off and you can just barely, barely not hit it. Well, if you've got an instant, you might be able to put yourself just over the line. That's the basics here with Aetherflux Reservoir, but how exactly are we casting all of those spells in a turn, you might ask? Well, we can do that thanks to the help of Paradoxical Outcome. Now, if Reservoir is the fish, this is the rice. You just roll them up together, you got yourself a delicious combination. Basically, the two cards were meant to go together. If we're trying to storm out and play a bunch of spells in one turn, then all we have to do is play a couple of cheap artifacts or cheap creatures, and then play Outcome, return them back to our hand, draw a bunch of cards, play them on the cheap again. That'll get us to seven or eight spells really, really fast, even if we don't really have that much mana to work with, because we've got a lot of zero and one cost artifacts in the deck. 
Plus, remember, again, that we're drawing a bunch of cards off of Paradoxical Outcomes. So even if we didn't start the turn with a ton of cheap artifacts that we can easily replay, then it's very likely that we'll draw into a bunch of cheap artifacts that we can play. So this is just awesome for increasing our storm count and really making those turns after we play Reservoir worth it. But that's pretty much the combo, so I guess I'm tapped out for now. I'll catch you cats later. I'm dead from the place. No, there's more. There's way more than that. So <laughs> there's a lot of stuff we have to play to help supplement this combo. And I'll start with one of my favorite cards in the deck, the three copies of Baral's Expertise. Now, the reason this card is so awesome in this deck is because it does two really important and very distinct and different things for us. You know, it serves its ostensive purpose of making some space for us, creating some time when we need it to help us combo off and getting some creatures off of our back. You know, it takes away all of our opponent's tempo up to that point in the game, or a great deal of our opponent's tempo at the very least, and lets us play a free Aetherflux Reservoir. Great way to turn the corner, but... What it also does, secret mode, is that we can return our own artifacts and creatures to our hand to make this a sort of a, a stand-in for paradoxical outcome. Or, you know, just give us more gas when we're trying to go off on a reservoir turn. Or maybe we top deck it when we're looking for action and we got to get something going. We've got our reservoir out, but we really don't have a lot of options as far as like spells to cast. Top decking this can get something going for you in the late game. So this just does it all. It's a great card for the deck. We should play at least three. Now, to make sure that we're using as little mana as possible while we're trying to storm out, we have to play whatever zero mana cost artifacts are available to us in the format. So to that end, we're going to play both of them. We're going to play four copies of Ornithopter and three copies of Mox Amber. That's funny, two deck techs in a row, Mox Amber shows up. But full disclosure, the only reason it's in this deck at all is because it costs nothing. That's it. That's all. You know, once we sideboard, we have at least a chance of tapping the Mox Amber for blue, but we don't. In game one, there are no legendaries in this deck that actually make this tap for mana. The entire, the sole purpose of the card is to be a zero-cost artifact for those paradoxical outcome terms. Same thing with Ornithopter, though. You might be tempted to think, oh, there's a good blocker in the early game, but to be honest, here's a real tip. You don't necessarily want to play Ornithopter or Mox Amber until you start going off with your Reservoir in play. And don't get me wrong, you play the Ornithopter to block if you would, like, otherwise die, yeah, you play the Ornithopter, you have my permission, but for the most part, you want to hold these until the turn that, the, that you plan on storming out with Ether Flux Reservoir, because what you really want to do with your Reservoir out is go Ornithopter, Ornithopter, Mox Amber, Paradoxical Outcome. That way, you've already cast, up th at this point, four spells in that turn, and you get to play three of them over again. So basically, what I'm saying is you want to get double credit for these zero-cost artifacts on the turns that you plan on storming out. But we're not just playing zero-cost artifacts here. Don't be a silly. We're actually going all the way up to three converted mana cost so that we can fit four copies of Inspiring Statuary in here. At first glance, this doesn't look super important, you know? It only works with, like, 12 different cards in the deck that aren't either artifacts or already have improvised. So it actually doesn't look like it helps cast that many cards in the deck. But the cards it does help cast are super important, you know? Like Paradoxical Outcome, if the only thing this worked with in the entire deck was Paradoxical Outcome, it would still be worth playing Inspiring Statuary. Because Statuary allows you to play an outcome for as little as one mana, which is amazing on turns where you're trying to storm out. Because the less mana you spend on an outcome, the more mana you have to spend on either the cards you drew from your outcome or just playing the cards that your outcome picked up in the first place. So that interaction is just important enough that if it didn't work with anything else, I would probably still play Statuary here, But, to be honest, it also works with Baral's Expertise, which is sweet. It can essentially generate mana value for you. You can play a Baral's Expertise for as little as two mana and get a free up to four mana cost spell. That is a pretty sweet deal. Plus, it works with a couple of other cards that we're playing. So, this is actually a really good card for the deck. Don't, rem or don't forget that it can tap itself. It's effectively a mana rock, but if you've got more than just this out, you got this and a couple of other artifacts, this makes a lot of your spells cost next to nothing. Now, honestly, those are all the big notes in the deck, but we do have to play a bunch of artifacts to back this strategy up, plus a few spells to back this combo up, too. So let me show you all the little artifacts that help enable what we're trying to do here. We're going to play four copies of Prophetic Prism, four copies of Renegade Map, and one copy of Traveler's Amulet to sort of finish off the artifact action here. Now, Prophetic Prism won't ever have to produce a different color of mana for you or anything. This is a monocolored deck, but the drawn card is that important. When you play it early, it helps you draw into combo pieces, and later, when you pick it up with a Paradoxical Outcome, not only will you draw a card from picking it up, but you draw a card when you play it again 
that's awesome when you're trying to contribute to a storm count. So Prophetic Prism doesn't look super impactful, but it's actually an incredible card in this deck because it will draw multiple cards over the course of a game a lot of the time. As far as Renegade Map and Traveler's Amulet, these both lower the land count a good bit. You know, they're awesome for that. Um, you know, we have to play a lot of combo pieces and things to supplement the combo. And it's great that these both do that and act as effectively lands for all intents and purposes. So we've got to play all of these. I like the one copy of Traveler's Amulet. Note that this is not my list. I've seen this list online five different times in articles and, you know, the, the list that, that um, did well at mocks. But I have not ever seen a different list outside of some changes to the sideboard. For the most part, the main deck is exactly the same no matter where you see this list. So this Traveler's Amulet is not my inclusion, full disclosure, but the reason that we're playing it is effectively to play a fifth copy of Renegade Map, because Renegade Map is that good. You know, it's a one-cost artifact. It's super cheap, so we can pick it up with a Paradoxical Outcome, draw that card, and play it again for very, very cheap if that's what we want to do, but it also helps us get the land drops we need in the early game if that's what we want to do with it. But I'll cap things off by sort of running through the last few cards that we're playing to supplement this combo deck. Starting with the three copies of Glintness Crane that we're playing because of, it's hard to imagine a better creature for this deck than Glintness. We're not playing a whole lot of creatures, and again, the creatures that we do play, we don't really care about. Like We're never going to really attack with a Glintness Crane, but it does block pretty well. It's got a relatively big butt in the early game. Helps to keep that damage off of our back. That's important, but it also always find something. There are 23 artifacts in this deck, so it's going to find an artifact, and it's awesome on turns where you're storming off. It only costs two mana to play, and if you've got a statuary in play, it only costs one mana to play. It's awesome to pick back up with a paradoxical outcome and play again, because it's going to find you an artifact again. <laughs> like, this is just really good whether you're storming off or whether you need to find combo pieces in the early game and have a blocker. It just does literally everything. You play the three copies. We're also going to play two copies of Commit to Memory in the deck. I really like this card because if we have a Statuary out, we can play both halves of this in the same turn for a total of three mana if we have enough artifacts. That's really, really dope. Plus, it's sort of a form of defense. At least the Commit half is. Uh, and that's nice. We can also save our own permanents by committing them to the top of our library. That's kind of good or with, within a couple of cards from the top of our library. Uh, look, if they're trying to bust Aetherflux Reservoir with an Abraid, we can save it with a commit. That's kind of nice. Um, but when it comes to memory, on a storm turn, if we have a statuary and we get to play a memory for just two mana, and we have open mana after that, it's more or less game over. We just drew seven fresh cards. It's very likely that we'll get some zero-cost artifacts in there or some one-cost artifacts. We can just close the game by playing one or two more artifacts after we draw our fresh seven. But to finish it off here, we are playing some cards that just naturally have Improvise. We're going to play four copies of Reverse Engineer and three copies of Metallic Rebuke. Rebuke is a necessary evil for this deck. You know, it doesn't look like it really synergizes well with all these other combo pieces, but we absolutely have to make room for it, no matter what, because it'll help us resolve an Aetherflux Reservoir against Counterspell decks. <laughs> Basically, against any control deck, whether it's Blue Black, Blue White, Grixis, there are actually a few different flavors of control in this format. It's not all Blue White, even though that's what you're mostly going to run into. But multiple decks in this format play Counterspells, is what I'm angling at here. And Metallic Rebuke, you absolutely have to have to help push through important, you know, things like Aetherflux Reservoir and Paradoxical Outcome. So you've got to play Rebuke against these control decks. Do it. Plus, you know, even if you're not playing against control, it counters like creatures that would otherwise kill you in a couple of turns, big threats and stuff. You know, it counters Planeswalkers that you might have an issue with. Whatever. You got, an, you got a problem with, this will counter in the early, all the way up to the mid game. So, Metallic Rebuke, you gotta play. Same thing with Reverse Engineer, though. This can cost as little as two mana very easily, and drawing three is very powerful for just the two mana. But even if it only, even if it costs you three mana, it's totally worth it to draw three cards. Just like Baral's Expertise, this is something else that can help us out if we've run out of gas, but we have an Aether Flux in play. If you top deck a Reverse Engineer, well, that's one towards your Storm Count, Plus, you drew three cards to go through your storm count. So this can actually help you win the game if you ran out of gas on an earlier turn and didn't quite get to 50 life. But of course, if you get it during an existing, like, ongoing storm turn, it's fine then, too. You know, if you draw this off of a paradoxical outcome and you have enough mana to play it, it can often seal the deal. Three cards is a lot. Plus, we're a combo deck. We're looking for pieces, so even if we're not storming off, this can help us find the reservoir or the outcome or whatever we're looking for at any given time. 
Now, this deck plays 18 lands, which looks low even to me. And I'm always trying to push the land count a little bit low, but 18 lands looks low to me, but we do have the Renegade map, we do have the uh, the Traveler's Amulet in the deck, plus we've got Inspiring Statuary, you know, to help make all the spells that cost the most in our deck cost a little bit less. So 18 lands is actually, turns out, being right <laughs> at the end of the day. And by the way, I gotta say, I love the Zalfir and Void here. Really good in our combo deck, plus most of our cards are artifacts anyway, so we're not that worried about generating blue mana. This is actually an awesome call. Well, here's our sideboard right here, and honestly, a lot of this, self-explanatory. You know, we've got the negate in there against the control decks, so we have more counterspell options, mostly to counter their counterspells. We've got River's Rebuke in there against, you know, really fast aggro decks or decks that fill their board and just curve out. Rebuke can buy us all the time we need against those decks, so it's important to play too. Padim is in there against all of the decks that play tons and tons of removal or can easily get rid of our Reservoir and stuff. Padim's great against them because they have to get rid of a, a Padim before they can abrade our Reservoir. That's important. And Baral is in there as well. Mostly the reason Baral is in there is because Mox Amber is in the deck. I am convinced that that is the reason that they're playing six legends in the sideboard is to help Mox Amber be good on, you know, late uh, Paradox Outcome Storm Out turns. That seems like it'd be awesome, but obviously Baral also reduces the cost of a bunch of your spells. And he gets better after sideboards where you'll have more counter spells. And here are your power rankings here. A 67 be your final score. That's crazy. Especially considering how bad the deck is in a bunch of traditionally important categories. You know, we don't have a whole lot of offense or defense. Usually the marks of a good deck. But what we do have is all of the synergy and all of the consistency because we can draw our deck. Like We just draw a ton of cards in this thing. And we're only one color, so we never have to worry, really, about mana issues. So this deck is uber consistent, extremely synergistic too. So, and it's fairly resilient because our combo piece gains us life. So even if we don't go off and win the game all in one big turn, we can at least gain enough life to stave off until we hit the next turn. And, by the way, note that game one, which is very real too, because no one is game planning against this deck right now. Between the red-based aggro decks and red-black and blue-white control and constrictor decks and stuff, just all the sideboard slots are taken up on other decks. You know, no one is planning on dealing with this thing at all. It can take people by surprise. It's reasonably fast, I'll say that again. And it out card advantages the control decks. Even if they just want to sandbag us and counter Aetherflux Reservoir, because that's the problem card, well, we've got main deck counter spells, and after boards, we've got seven counter spells. Not to mention Commit is in the deck too. That can send counter spells back to their hand while they're on the stack. So we've actually got some decent options against these control decks. And against any mid-range deck in the format like Constrictor, it's more or less a free win for us. And the best news is that the deck is really, really cheap for what it does. Again, I think this is a serious deck that multiple serious people were taking seriously just recently. So I think it's a good deck to be playing right now, especially when it only costs you about 85 bucks. Now, if you're interested in doing just that, just click the first link in the description down there. That'll take you over to my sponsors at TCG Player, where you can get this deck for the cheapest price on the interwebs. Some places this deck's gonna cost you like over a hundred bucks. That's ridiculous. Go to TCG Player, get it for like $85. But this time I'm actually tapped out. Just do all the YouTube stuff. All you gotta do is hit the like button and put me in more recommended feeds. That would be much appreciated. Subscribe if you're new, hit the bell for the notifications to make sure you actually get notifications. Uh, apparently you gotta do that now. And you want them because there's a few more decks to do in Dominaria Standard. we got to do the Dominaria tier list next. You want to be around for that video. Plus, Corset 2019 spoilers are already rolling out, and i got to get to those like in the next week. So you want all that content, sub, hit the bell. Do all that, plus follow me on Twitter at SBMTGDev, or throw me a dollar a month over on Patreon.com slash SBMTG if you want to support the channel. If you do that, just a buck a month, just a buck a month. That'll let you know what decks we do the day before I actually upload the videos. And you get to vote on what decks you want to see sometimes, too. It's a lot of value for a buck. So do all that stuff, and I'll catch you cats later. I'm Deb from The Place. Thanks for watching, my wizards. Spread love and be kind.